All right, thanks, Kathleen. Hello, um, and thanks, Catherine, for everything you've done to get me out here in Landmarks and Mike Smith, who I've known for, um, I think, 15 years now. And uh, this is my first time to Austin, and I went for a long walk uh, like, and bike ride, three and a half hours this morning. And I went by the uh, store, I think it's called Venus in Disguise on South Congress, which is like a costume shop. And I've always heard Lucy's in Disguise. And I was like, oh yeah, this is, I've heard so many people love, you know, this uh, such a creative city. And then I realized, like, creative cities have to have costume shops to be of a certain ilk. And I'm sure there's some correlation between, between creativity and costume shops. Because I lamented when the costume shop in Times Square closed in New York when I lived there in Los Angeles, there's many costume shops, which I use often um, for my work. So now, um, I thought I'd just show you, you know, go back from when I started making uh, artwork, but I started firstly with a more current painting from uh, nine, uh, 2014, and it's people looking at something abstract, and I'm just gonna start with this painting, and it's gonna reappear later, this is a theme of abstraction and representation um, in my work. And I, I had a BA in, um, American literature from the University of Michigan, and I didn't take any painting and drawing class, so I'm slowly getting into making paintings. And so these are some early watercolors that are just copies from climax scenes from um, films. This is Men in Black. I would just copy from climax scenes. I made a whole film of climax explosions. I made this one project um, here where these are watercolors again, and there are different museums um, in ruins. Those close-ups, these are really, I think they're probably about 30 by 40, and then the actual museum drawing. They're really high detailed. This is the Museo Rufino Tamayo in Mexico City. And I had the um, curators from the museum send me pictures, so that I, and I drew from the pictures they sent me. I also do this work, a uh, collaborative performance with a composer named Michael Webster, who lives in Los Angeles whose favorite um, instrument is the piano. So I thought, let's just have a piano on stage and then I move around. And I studied buto dance in Japan with Min Tanaka. And I, I don't do dance per se, but I do a lot of movement type performances and um, a lot of slow motion bits. And in this case, I'm doing some magic tricks. And of course, I've. I've cut a hole under the table so my arm goes way down and I'm pulling all kinds of stuff out. It's a little bit like Mama Chance in vaudeville. And there's a pose from Christine's World that was the advertisement to the show, of the, the, the wife painting. And here's a bunch of dollars that fall out of a trap door, which um, I tried to stuff in my pocket. Here's another performance that um, I did. This is at the Atlanta College of Art, and this is uh, male fashion models make conceptual art. And we worked with the elite modeling, modeling agency um, in Atlanta to get these guys that I, that I got materials for, very crafty materials, materials I, am, I don't use in my own work. And I, they came to the gallery a few hours before the exhibition was to open. I told them, just wear jeans, and you're gonna go shirtless and gave the materials and just said, go. And then the opening came and people caught full on the models um, making artwork. And I made a little like flat pedestal for them or a stage um, as well. Whoops, and here's. And then I, I did it again in London in a small commercial gallery and the guys, it was a brand new gallery, and the guys destroyed, basically destroyed the space. And I felt awful, but then also I felt so excited about just the destruction of male models, the unleashing the creative power of male models. <laughs> um, and I loved the film Zoolander so much, and the gasoline fight segueing into a sculpture of the gasoline fight somehow it was like a really interesting idea 
for me. So in my own artwork, if I can approach to something like that, it makes me um, happy with my own tools that I have, my own resources that I have to make art with. So then I started to work with color in watercolors. And this is a painting called um, Plain, I think it's called Me Playing Scrabble with Myself in the Mirror, right? And uh, the, uh, this Lacanian idea of being a fractured individual and trying to put together your whole picture out in the whole world of, of forms and shapes was really interesting on this piece. And I thought it was like a game if I could try to figure out you know, who am I through Scrabble? Here's another. This one's really big. This is, I think, 120 inches across and 60 inches above. Why are you here? I always was thinking about from films the trap doors in offices and if they could have trap doors at, for art viewing too. Like, why are you looking at art? And I'm always concerned, not concerned, but I'm curious what people see in art, and I'm curious about what I see in artwork as well when I go to look at something. This is a barrel going over a waterfall. This is a building in knot. These are all um, 30 by 40. This again is watercolor on paper. And here's another um, collaboration. I think I've done four, maybe five of these collaborations with Michael Webster. And um, it kind of, this one was a little more, it was a shipping container. So we all had to, all these artists were able to do whatever they wanted to in shipping containers. So we made a, um, cut a hole, we put a piece of wood. Let's see if you can see this, see if I can see this. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, we kind of made a slanted area there and let little uh, holes that people could like, well, whack-a-mole game. And people could put their heads through. And we did shows every 10 minutes. And uh, there were some pie, peanut butter, and sandwiches, all these themes that come up in this um, body of work. Again, and I show off my vaudeville skills. This time I'm juggling. And um, this is just a, in this performance work, I um, usually get a pie in the face and put my own pie in my own face. And this is a catapult launcher. And I designed this, I had this specific, and this is what I think art really is um, for me at many times the best. When I had this, I had a problem. And my problem was how do I get a catapult launcher onto stage with me and build it? Because you can't go to a store and buy a, catapult, a pie catapult launching machine or order one on the internet. So I had to design one that would function just for how I needed it for this one moment. And I, like the wheels went off, the light bulbs went off when I did that. I said, oh my God, this is amazing. Like this is something that's so special. And I think maybe that's, or so unique to this certain problem. Maybe that's what um, art is. Here's another performance I did. Um, a couple of times, and the um, host would put up these flyers around town. I, I solicit performers many times using flyers because I love looking at flyers. I love going to college and university campuses to look at flyers, coffee shops. I love to look at flyers to see what's going on. Here's another one. So the people that um, got these phone numbers called and then um, they were told to go to the op art opening. They're all paid. They're told to go to the art opening, and then they, at a certain point, they were to decide beforehand when they were going to grab me and hang me up by my underwear on a hook on the wall. So basically, give me a wedgie um, sometime during the performance. And um, I've done this a couple of times, and I again I had to solve problems again, and I had to. Um, and, and I was working in my uh, girlfriend's apartment at the time, and I was had a hook, and I'd hook my underwear up on there, and I'd do that whoosh, rip off. So I'd go, oh, oh, two pairs. So then I'd stitch two pair of underwear, to hook it up, whoosh, come down, and I'd do that until I finally got the right number of underwear, which was four, all stitched together. And I thought this was again a really interesting problem to solve. And and when I was a boy, 
And some of my work, and I neglect to say this, some of this work comes from personal experiences like the football, like sneaking onto the football field at the University of Michigan inspired this football video. And when I was a boy, I got hung up by my underwear in the locker room when I you know, went to the new school. And I remember screaming in a high voice. And um, this time, these other times when I did, people usually clapped or laughed, and it was um, different. Here's an outdoor performance. Um, that I did. It was part of, uh, this is a sculpture, and um, there's a little uh, cell phone that controls the knot there. And this is in Vancouver at the Yale Street Station. And for two and a half years, I would turn off that knot if I was making work or not making work. Um, so it was like, Joseph is making art, Joseph isn't making work. So I would call this phone if I was making work or I was bored or I wake up in the middle of the night or I was driving home, just knowing I was turning on a little sculpture at the Yale Town Station up in Vancouver. Um, here's another, this is another body of watercolors, and this one's called Me and Kippenberger. And this is an idea I had, what would I do with Martin Kippenberger if we could collaborate on some art project? This is, this is as far as I got. And then uh, this is a painting called The Book of Ridiculous Paintings. This is no Missile, Yes Missile, these are all 30 by 40 or 40 by 30. This is a, a motion picture. This is a like some guys making an industrial, I used to make industrial films and this is an industrial film for a, a breast making factory. And I just thought this is the most completely ridiculous scenario because I was copying the factory from an I Love Lucy episode somehow. <laughs> Yep, and here's another performance. This one's called Torch Trouble. Again, with Michael Webster. This is at the Happy Lion Gallery. This I have some more themes of magic, and here's more trap doors. Stuff always falls on my head, and I make, instead of peanut butter sandwiches, I make breakfast cereal, and I played the uh, vibraphone at the, for the climax of it. I uh, explode, I explode things. There's lots of, and uh, this is I, for the climax I made this and I glued, put Cheetos and feathers on it and then I climbed, I slid through it after all these things fell on my head. It's really sad and funny work and I was so proud of myself on this one because there was a gag there where I fake blow torch, just called torch trouble and I fake blow torched and sealed everybody into the gallery so they couldn't leave the gallery, I thought that was really funny, but we actually had people trying to sneak in to see the show because it was at capacity. Glitter. Uh, there's me going through for the end of the show. Here's another performance I did at London at the MOT International Gallery. Um, and this is uh, talking about my drawings with escorts and the gallery hired two escorts to do a walkthrough of my exhibition and it was a public exhibition, and they were prompted to ask questions like, why did you do this, and what did this mean, and anything else that came to them. And this one's, I think, uh, tic-tac-toe with cock and balls. And I, there's that Matthew Broderick film where the computer learns at the end that no one can ever win tic-tac-toe. There's a man with afro. Are you from Hollywood? These are all um, 11 by 17. This is uh, shoveling art history into a canyon with a, what do you call it, a backhoe. TMZ, I made with a pilgrim's hat. I was really, I moved to the West Coast from Chicago and I thought, oh, I'm so far. And I studied, I studied Literature, American literature and transcendental literature. I lived on a like, commune in New Hampshire studying like in the cr crucible of a certain kind of thought and a history and I was, I see sometimes these puritanical ideas as they trickled into the landscape of Los Angeles. And this is, I have landscape drawings with T TMZ logos in them, but this is just the logo with the pilgrims, a Puritan's hat, John Baldessari, with the Ten Commandments. 
Here's a, a painting, oil painting. This is, I started to work in oils now. This is 2013, I believe, and this is a, a policeman pyramid. And this is a boardwalk uh, with ATM. This is a movie uh, film projector, and it's projecting, I don't know if you can see from the slide, its own destruction. And I kind of just started to think, like, in terms of the circle of, of cinema, and cinema just is this repeating of destruction, creation, destruction. This is just what one of the things that happens in movies. This was a one-off. I just thought it'd be funny, like, kind of absurd that the president would ever have to hand out his business card. <laughs> um, this is called a hand with spork. And you can see down here, there's maybe that hand that was part of that video now, and it has a, a spork. Um, this is um, toenails. And these are two um, Vietnam War scenes, which I painted into um, on top of toenails. This is like a sergeant calling in strikes. And then this is a mess hall. This is a um, sculpture called uh, Two Snakes in Box. And I don't work in, two, in sculpture too often. Um, but this one has sound coming out of the box. Um, and it's British voices going, cup of tea, cup of tea, in different voice, different British accents that I was doing myself. And I just took old shirts to make the um, snakes. This is the last um, performance I did with Michael Webster, um, Der Hintern in der Luft. And I was very happy with this performance. We did this at um, Laura Owen's studio. She had just started this gallery, Mission Road, which is now just this like fantastic place to see art in Los Angeles. It's a huge warehouse. And I started the whole show. Um, you can see this rope that's tied to my hiney there, and I have the whole show um, hanging from a pulley. It's a 16-foot ceiling right there. And we didn't let everybody in until the show started, and they were confronted with this problem again. Well, the guy's got a whole show hanging from his hiney. And I remember terrified lying there flat. Of course, we rehearsed it many times, but thinking, oh my gosh, the, um, I don't know, this is, this, this is the voice, I, this is not going to work, this is not going to work. But then the audience quieted down. I said, oh my gosh, like, they see that there's a, a problem that's going to be solved. And Laura Owens gave us one of her paintings as a prop, which I, um, there's Michael Webster playing the piano. This is a plant we had who came out and sang an opera climax. He's my neighbor. He's got this amazing operatic voice. I lit things on fire. There's another pie catapult in my face. I make these little sculptures. Um, there's, I'm, reaching, I'm reaching for another contraption I've made. with. There's ping pong balls and Gatorade, which I've written um, people's names that I see in the audience on there. It falls on my head. And for the climax, I hoist myself up then, um, and the opera singer starts to sing. And you can see earlier, I've. I sliced a hole, ripped into Laura Owen's painting, and I had this corny idea, which I see all the time. It's like, what's in the painting? And I went into the painting, and I just emptied a bunch of trash, things that I didn't want anymore. I organized them by color. Um, so it went on the last was blues. And then I put um, glitter on top of it. And as I hoist myself up, this, you know, this deep baritone voice came out and sang about the artist. He's accomplished his goal. His, his butt is in the air. His butt is in the air. And then we had this wood chipper on the side of stage, a huge thing that we fired up. And it got deftly loud. And then we started chopping up Laura's painting and taking all my props and sticking them into the wood chipper. And it was loud. People were covering their ears. And we just you know, destroyed all these things that we just had kind of destroyed already, but destroyed it again. Um, and it was a really just an um, interesting performance, not only because of um, the destruction of art, but I think something about, like, um, people said that they were playing with me. That's what some of my friends said. Um, and you really have to see some of this to, to get a notion of how it functions. So here's um, 
this is a new gallery that started in Los Angeles, Tiff Siegfrieds, and she started this gallery because um, she, I said, do you want to do a, can I do a show in your ear? And she was having artist talks at this bar in Los Angeles called Hop Louie, and I'd done a show and a film that I really liked about a, uh, called The Jekyll, I think. It's a British film about a man that gives up everything to become an abstract painter. And um, so she started this gallery, so I made this teeny little gallery space and put it in her ear, and for her new show, she had no art on the wall. And, um, and to see the artwork, you had to go up and look into her ear. And I remember her saying, you know, it's really funny, because sometimes you go to the art shows and nobody see, looks at the art, they just drink the beer, or they talk, or they try to you know, meet some whomever is there. And, um, and this kind of fit into that parameter completely. So here's the paintings then. I taught myself um, how to paint on a micro level. So these paintings are all uh, like five sixty-fourths, I think is what they are. And I painted under a microscope and I had to slow my body down so much that I could only make a brush stroke when I emptied out all of my breath. Because if I was breathing, that was way too much movement under the microscope. Um, and so some of the elements on this painting are just, they're just pigments, you know, just little bits of pigments that become the eyes here. And my palette was this teeny, teeny, teeny palette. And I had to make my own paint brushes too. And I thought like, oh, you know, an eyelash. I thought the eyelash is gonna be great, way too big. And then I got an acupuncture needle, the smallest acupuncture needle, you know, point one, two millimeters. And that was way too big. So I had to shave that tip of it down under the microscope to get a point small enough to um, paint with, and then, then I found a piece of uh, uh, this herb, what is it called, rosemary, like a rosemary twig that had a lot of sap, and I could shave that down to a microscope, and it held its form, so I had a strong tool and a soft tool to work the oil paint on styrene. So I was like, wow, this is, this is new work. It took me a couple months to figure out how to do that, and then to paint the show, it took just, uh, you know, like a few days to do it. Here's another painting. They're all untitled except this one's for Russell, one of my friends. There's a man crying. And these are, that's chips of uh, glitter, right? And I had to, those are teeny, 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 teeny. I lost a couple paintings while I was um, making them. So this was uh, my last show in my New York gallery, um, and I've started to make these promotional films for exhibitions, and it's the short format for me has been so much fun to work with, and I can be very concise in a short amount of time. And here is one of those films. So for that exhibition, then I made this, this is another 40 by 30 painting. It's a still life with hot dogs. Those are shotgun, different shotguns, and a hot dog in violet. And then I did a similar one in orange. And then I, a uh, man with dog in chest. And then this is the painting that I showed you earlier, the couple looking at something abstract. And it's just a finger paint. I took the primary colors and I just kind of swirled it together. Um, and this is modeled after a cemetery, right? So I had all these little abstract painting blocks there. And then in the back room of the gallery, I had um, this bowl filled with guppies. And then this is a Chef Boyardee can. And I had little voices. I had. I did an Italian voice asking the guppies, why are you here? And the guppies talking in a guppy voice. I can't do it um, now, but answering the questions from the chef Boyardee can. And the guppies are just like, you know, we're here to just, um, you, know, you know, swim around, eat, and, you know, make more guppies. That was the, the conversation of this room. And the wallpaper, I just had it said American sex all over in font. So the floor 
and the walls, and uh, the ceiling was left um, intact. So my next um, artwork that I made at an art fair, because I've, I've been, been in a ton of art fairs and I've had actually no context for the work at all and no discussion about the work. It's like a vacuum that you just pour stuff into and it disappears or it comes back, both of those. And I tell you, for me, it's not as um, rewarding as when I can get a conversation going about artwork in that context, because it's a tough context for artwork um, to be communi to communicate things with. So here's a performance um, that I did. My gallerist, she was um, giving birth during the weekend. She was scheduled to give birth, so I said to her, I said, can, we, can I hire a car salesman? Can we hire a car salesman to work the booth while you're giving birth? And she's like, that's a great idea. So then we talked to the fair, and they're like, that's a great idea. So we did outreach, and we found the Lexus, Lexus car specialist here. And there was another man from um, Tesla who came, too. And they came to the gallery, gave them all this information on my work. I did studio visits with two car salesmen. And I tell you, artists here, do a, car sale, do a visit with a car salesman. It's awesome. They made me feel so good about being an artist and so positive they were going to sell all the paintings in the show. Um, and people just got completely freaked out by it. Some people, people were coming up to me, dealers and artists, and just telling me what they thought. I'm like, well, great. This is, I was like, it's successful. It's like working. The card salesman, he was like, man, this is awesome. He goes, people are so good looking. They dress well. There's champagne everywhere. They get all this money. He's like, forget cars. I want to get into the arts, which he did. Um, and... Uh, and so here's the paintings that they um, sold, and, and only some of them sold. I'm going quickly because I just have, I'm going to have five more minutes to show you one more artwork. Um, so here's another, um, here's my last show that I did with the gallery. Um, Tiff Sigbrid's in LA again, and it's the Painted Horse. And here's another short video I made for promotional for the film. And I was so great because I was able to talk about a relationship to abstract painting. And um, I have it, the film is the po famous Pollock drip painting by Chaim Liam or whatever his name, I can't recall right now, it's in this film. So we'll watch this film and I'll show you a couple pictures. Right, so I got to gallop through like a little sentence on um, Jackson Pollock and the atom bomb, and um, then do use Hitchcock's voice for the good evening. And then for the exhibition, I worked with the interior designer to develop this, make this, design this, um, the, this is the gallery, turn it into a collector's living room. And then I did studio visits with artists in LA and selected some abstract work to go in the exhibition. And then for my um, abstract work. I painted this horse Reba using vegan dyes and shaved and and um, and dyed her. And I had to teach myself how to do that. I worked with a creative groomer, explored the whole world of creative grooming, just through a few people, interviewed tons of different um, groomers until I found the right um, woman to work with on this. And then the gallery had a bridge had um, short hours. It was like a four-hour work day with a one hour break for the horse. And here's a painting one artist made of collectors. We kind of imagine these collectors. This is my mom and her boyfriend. And we, you know, I've always wanted to have a vineyard. So I said, yeah, paint, you know, paint, a, paint. they own a vineyard, these collectors, these imaginary world. And this is their living room. And these are the artists that they collect in depth. And the horse just roamed around. People had to make schedule appointments. They had to sign a waiver to, um, to come in and meet Reba. And I met so many horses. Again, this was a weird, plus in the making. I met so many horses over the year and until I found this right horse. It was just, she was a feral horse that the owners rescued and she's super, 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 she loves to be around people, loves to be the center of attention. And she's housebroken. This is one of these ideas to take these miniature horses that were designed for visual pleasure. These were just um, aristocracy toys to have around the house to look at. I said, oh my gosh, this is a great animal then to 
have in visual culture because we're supposed to look at, enjoy looking at things and thinking about things. So that was kind of the material of this horse, um, why I chose it. And I, this idea came to me. I think I was watching the Kentucky Derby, and there was a little painting of a flower on one of the horses that was leading the stallions out to gate to keep it calm before the race. And I thought, what a great surface. But then, like the show, I started to think even more ambitiously about how to control the reception of your own artwork so that, um, I don't know if you've been to Marfa and the Judd Foundation, and I'm not um, that wild about his particular work until I saw it in the Judd Foundation. And I saw that context that he created and the landscape that I passed through and my relationship to sun and everything to come and confront in those barracks, those cubes with the landscape behind, I said, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. And I think that kind of influenced this work as well as trying to shape the entire context for um, this painted horse. And then for, the paintings were all for sale. And there was a, we built a corral there. I got into a huge argument with a designer about a corral. He said, it can't, it's distracting from the eye. See, I make a terrible painter. Because I said, because it tracks from the eye, because everything was color coordinated. I said, dude, it's a it's an art gallery, and it's a horse is in here, but it's not about the design. It's a horse, so it's okay to have a non sequitur within this space. And I have anecdotes from the design community that some other people are talking about gates and corrals, and but that's another conversation. Um, here's the horse. Here's another detail. The people signed in, signed waivers. Here's another painting of the collectors on their boat, sailboat together. So my mom and her boyfriend again. And then um, before the shoot, I took this horse around um, to uh, collectors' homes and photographed it as if you were to own this home horse, this is what it would look like. And to an artist studio, one that has a much more artistic look. You can see, I work in my garage, basically, that I've um, redone, but I thought that to communicate, you know, A with a capital R, I went to a friend's studio Here's another collector's house. And here's another collector's house. I worked in educational and in industrial filmmaking before, so I had that kind of language, like in that film Watercolor, a very simple um, or unique language. So I thought this was, these are like instructional photographs. So, so that's, that's it. That's what I have. So it, I'm here for any questions, um, too. So thank you. It, um, a lot, I really, you know, I think like a lot of times that art is for artists and that um, I'm talking to these artists with certain ideas that they have or images or performances that um, really capture my imagination. So I really, I try to bring some of those things into um, my work. I know we talked, we had spoken about the Vanessa Beecroft performance back in the 90s, I think, and it was Maybe it was for a Whitney by Neil. I can't recall where it was, but it was all these uh, women wearing like maroon dresses and their hair was pulled back and they were just in a room and the camera kind of looked at them and it really, I was like, wow, what? That doesn't fit into anything I know before. It was so interesting. I kind of, and I think about Andrea Fraser's um, work a lot because I know in some of her performances she'll, you know, she'll talk and then take off her clothes as she's talking about, um, you know, I don't know exactly what she's talking about. I get lost on just, she's talking, she's taking off her clothes, or she's getting turned on by the, she's a docent, she's getting turned on by the museum space there itself, or she was on a panel with Mary Kelly, and she, this is, she's like crying, because she's going, you know, I'm so happy about being an artist, and thanks to my mom, because she gave me the courage to just paint for the first time, and, you know, she's just cry, crying in the middle of a serious discussion that these women were having, and I kind of thought that was a, that's a really cool thing, that like my studio visit piece, I knew that I was gonna make some artwork right when people were coming over to talk about, you know, what's going on in Joe Sola's studio. You know, and having these performers up here as well was another way of kind of addressing that um, interest. But the short format uh, video, I really, it's a, it's something else that I've just been able to, as of the last couple of years, start to think about and start to, to work with, too. And I'm sure that some of these other 
ideas will work into that format. Um, you know, I'm surprised because I got that made that horror film, and I don't like horror, but I'm beginning to like horror. Like, I don't like to look at things like that, but um, like that film's really, it's funny. I wouldn't have made that when I was younger, for sure. There's no, there's no way I would have said not, I'm not gonna be that grotesque, or, but funny too. I mean, people, I could see people were laughing when that film showed. People were cracking up and screaming at the same time, and I thought that was really interesting. So it's, it's changing, you know, it's, it's definitely changing, but I'm bringing some more, I think, well, I don't know if I'll ever make a horror-based film again. Yeah, I'm not sure. But, uh, but I know that comedy is, one, I get a lot of pleasure out of my own work. And, um, and I know that John Baldessari, when he was teaching, he, I didn't have a student, but he always said that, um, that you have to really enjoy your work. It doesn't have to be funny, but Paul McCarthy, I know he has this video that's um, him, it's a TV show, and he's rubbing ketchup all over a chair, and he's going, enjoy your work, enjoy your work, like that's his work, and he's, I know, I think he's having, at least he's saying he's having fun with it, but I think that there's a certain kind of pleasure for the comedy, and, and comedy too, for me is so much, I don't know if you guys um, in the art program here, if you study semiotics, that's part of it, but you know, I always think about, um, you know, like those rupture of the signs, how that happens is a lot like how comedy happens. And, you know, I think that, that sometimes comedy is so abrupt and so um, aggressive in terms of how we see how our whole symbolic world is oriented, that comedy pulls that out sometimes. In art, that's a really helpful way sometimes to just start to get at, um, some, get at something. It's all it's all scripted. I storyboard everything, and I've like reshot things too that haven't worked out. To um, and uh, yeah, I'm really. I spend a lot of time just sitting, sketching things, sketching things out, um, and I'm trying to think if there's things for chance in work. I sometimes do that, but the performance, like I didn't show you those any of those performances that I any videos from those performances, but um, they're like 45 minutes long and they're really, really structured throughout the, um, the piece too. I'm trying to think if I, I know that I had, I can't think of it off time where I have chance things happen. I know that the conversations that I had when I made Studio Visit, I knew I didn't know what was gonna happen. Like I thought people, some people would be like, yeah, I'm out of here. Like what's, I can't believe I said that I would watch you do the jump out your window. Um, I think there was a lot of open conversations that were had um, from that, but I really enjoyed drawing. I have lots of, I make lots of films that I just draw out and then they just stay in the, in the sketchbook until they make it to the next level of, um, of action. They came from friends and I was so happy that Catherine said, do you wanna, Catherine said, do you wanna do a performance when you're out here? And I was, Lecture, performance, and oh my God, yes, because I um, have always had this image. I get a lot of ideas from hanging around with friends and talking, and um, and I always had this idea. I was to have, and thanks to Sam, who's back there for contemplating with his mustache. Um, I always had this idea to have a discussion about my work or a lecture about my work, and have this image there um, as well. And then I. I've, sometimes I've had a performance of somebody running in place, too, is just kind of, um, I've seen it a couple times, too, and it's always struck me as kind of futile, but then also, um, you know, a lot of energy expended on it, too. And this was a, and then I know one of my friends, um, he was teaching curating at the, I think, St. Martin's College in London, and and he always, he said that he'd always put a movie on when in his class so that if students got really, if they got bored, they could just watch TV instead. And I always thought like, yeah. Like, at first I was like, yeah, okay. That's, I thought I'd love to 
put that up there to, you know, my work as well. If you know, because I some sometimes I'm always, and I thought, yeah, you can watch this program too. And I really think I was telling Catherine too. I think about Bernie's that weekend. I don't think it's a good film necessarily, but I think it's amazing that this person's dead for the whole film and they're not moving. I think that's. I'm still really interested in that whole kind of like not moving or trying to be dead and doing something when you're dead or acting like you're dead or not moving like you're dead. So that's kind of like a really interesting problem that I'm thinking about a lot. So for me, you know, in this lecture to even start to start to think about that in terms of my own work again or, you know, other projects. Or maybe it's, maybe I've said it there right there. That's good. So I can, I don't know, but that's kind of how, I guess, to your idea about chance, like sometimes the work, like I sketch it all out, but like in moments like this, you don't know necessarily where it, is going to, but you're interested in somehow just seeing what it looks like, or experiencing it, or, you know. Oh, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to um, have a um, anesthesiologist knock me out in our fair, so I just sit there, uh, or in the stock market, too, and I, I told I was had this dealer once, and I asked her, she's like, no way, and she had this anesthesiologist collector, too, that she kind of knew, she's like, no, I refuse to do that, like, that's full on, so I haven't um, talked about it, except for on Bomb Magazine, yeah, I mentioned that, but I, and I always imagine to, you know, as, <clears throat> you know, dress really, really nicely, too, and just be out, and I know that, who's that, uh, that Canadian artist that, he has the Halcyon Days piece, where he's just knocked on a house and the cab driver drives him back to his hotel. And it's just a video of him like passed out in his car getting home. And I thought that was Rodney Graham, Rodney Graham. And I thought like this piece um, would get into my, you know, f my interest in or disinterest in that context for sharing and selling artwork um, too. It's so funny because the art that sales so many people had their opinions about that sales, hiring a car salesman for selling art in an art fair. Uh, and you know, one, one dealer, he said, he goes, yeah, Joe, it used to be about relationships, but he's like, now it's not, because it's just like, woo, you know, whatever. But that was just one person's view. There's, I think there's a lot of dealers that it's still just about relationships in the art fair environment. Um, but you know, I, don't, I hate being operated on don't, don't like, and I don't like needles, <laughs> but I know that there's probably got to be a great concoction that's just perfect so that you just feel great, <laughs> and then you just drift away, <laughs> and then you're just, you know, in a nice suit with some nice shiny shoes on just for, you know, three days, and then you wake up, <laughs> and you said, wow, you know, I've just made art, <laughs> and, <laughs> and just, did you sell me? <laughs> Did I sell? <laughs> All right, thank you.